Hi everyone, my name is Kamviz Ranavardi. I'm co-president of Columbia DC and a graduate of School of Engineering and Applied Science. We are very honored to have Kate Griffith and Norm Yost of the Flying Goat Cellars in Lampe, California to talk about their incredible wines with our host, John Bonet. Please allow me to briefly introduce them. I would encourage everyone to check our website for their full bio and detailed list of their accomplishments. Kate Griffith, Chief Philosopher and Proprietor, graduated with a master's degree from the University of California, San Diego and Columbia University School of International Public Affairs. She has over 40 years of communications, branding, and marketing experience. In 2002, Kate relocated to work for the city of Lompoc and help grow the infant wine industry. In, in Lompoc, she, she met uh, the love of her life, married Norm Yost, on, uh, in 2010 and began working for uh, Flying Goat Cellars. Norm Yost, winemaker and proprietor, graduated from the University of California, Davis, with a bachelor's degree in environmental studies in 1981. He attributes the success of Flying Goat Cellars, which he launched in 2000, to his vast experience in, in the industry. Last but not least, our host, John Bonet, is currently the managing editor of Resi. That comes after several years as senior contributing editor for Punch, where he has written a regular column and for nearly a decade, he was the wine editor and chief wine critic of the San Francisco Chronicle. And he's a graduate of Columbia College in 94. Without further ado, John, take it away. I can see myself and myself only. There we go. There's everyone. You can see how um, glamorous Paris is at midnight. Um, from our kitchen. Um, Kate, Norm, a huge thanks for joining us and to everyone who's uh, here this uh, this evening, thank you as well. Um, I'm guessing at least some of the folks with us have uh, gotten a chance to taste some of the wines and have gotten the recipe uh, and the video as well, I believe. Um, so let's... Um, not to start at the beginning, but um, but Kate, tell tell us a little bit about uh, sort of coming out of Colombia and how what you did then, which obviously was a fair ways away from uh, getting to Lompoc and the Santa Rita Hills and the wine industry. Exciting place I've ever lived. Um, and um, I was there for a year and a half. It was a, it was a very exciting time in Brazil. But um, anyway, I I was a spe I became a specialist in informatics policy there, and then ultimately went back to California and um, got another master's degree and was a specialist in the telecommunication uh, sector in Mexico. So anyway, fast forward. I was involved with NAFTA with Mexican government for two years. I was a foreign agent for them, which was unusual for an American woman to be working for them, but it was all quite heady times in uh, DC. <laughs> so, and, and how I landed in Lompoc? Well, at 45, I decided I needed to stop dealing. I've been working in Latin America for 20 years and I couldn't take the volatility of the region anymore. And I just decided, give me a little provincial town in California. And I, got, I took a job with the city. And that's how I met. The, it's a bird. It was a it was a, a nascent wine industry at the time, but I could see the the diamond in the rough, and that's how I ended up meeting my husband. Fantastic! And now uh, you got there in two thousand ten. No, I got there in two thousand two. Okay, so you've been, you've been there for a while before before you ever came to Flying Go. Yes, I I met my husband a few years later, but we didn't marry until twenty ten. But I um I yeah, I worked for the city of Lompoc for uh, seven years, so that was quite a different world. But you know, it's 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 all uh, <laughs> it's all about the journey, right? And people sure. often wondered how did you end up in such you know a small, relatively small community. 
And it's a very unique place. Um, as, among other things, the flower seed capital of the world. Um, <laughs> it was, it was. Now it's more. Former, former flower seed capital of the world. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a fair amount about history, but, but just for, for everyone who's here, like, situate, situate us a little bit. Where, where is Lompoc? Where is it in, in California? Kind of put, put a pin in the map a little bit. Okay, so it's about two and a half hours north of Los Angeles and about five hours south of San Francisco. So where Point Conception is, which is when you're going on the, on the Pacific coast, it's where the, the, um, the coast sticks out and it's quite prominent. It's going south and it starts going east. Exactly, and, and Denver Air Force Base is our neighbor, so that's another, um, but it's lovely because we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of undeveloped property right on the coast and um, miles, hundred, over 100 miles of undeveloped coastline will never be developed, so it's a special part of the world, very unique, you know, very, um, a lot of natural beauty here. But it's also become known for its um, Santa Rita Hills wine appellation, which is famous now for Pinot Noirs and Chardonnay as is Santa Maria Valley. Santa Maria Valley is a little bit about half an hour north of here, but the Santa Rita Hills has an east-west um, or west-east um, valley that creates this cool, cool climate constantly coming in from the ocean. So the big, the big funnel. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, to, to help identify, it's the West Coast Space Launch. Yes. <laughs> And we, actually, and we actually launch more than a Kennedy does these days because we launch missiles and satellites. So it's pretty exciting. We've got, you know, SpaceX here and Bezos is talking about coming on. So we've got a lot of exciting things going for small which, towns. Yeah, which keeps things interesting there. I think <laughs> a lot of folks don't know that. Um, and so, Norm, catch us up a little as well. Uh, so you, you're originally from the Northwest, um, but then you went to Davis. Correct. So I was born in uh, actually Seattle and then uh, basically transplanted to California, specifically San Francisco, raised in the city in the 60s. I wasn't a flower child, but uh, I think I believe my parents were in some aspect of it. Um, and then moved to Marin County and then went to Davis as, as a, uh, on a just kind of an opportunity or showed up to go to school there and play football and turned out to have a wonderful uh, educational career. Uh, but I was kind of in the, I went in the wrong direction. I was kind of going in the environmental movement direction and realized that uh, I don't push papers well. I don't do reports well. So I realized working my mind. And, my and you became family, a winemaker. Yes, I became a winemaker. I work <laughs> so, my which, which seems to be like 90% paperwork. Yeah, well, now yes, it does. Got it. But I think just being the, 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 the creating them, I actually, my first job in Napa Valley was taking the dormer off the old cow barn at Silver Oak Cellars. So I, I got into Napa Valley by just doing construction work. And that was kind of my, I said, well, I'm here in Napa. It's not making wine, but I'm, I'm, I got my foot in the door. And that was kind of the opening for um, other opportunities. And then I actually got a job in a winery called Monticello Cellars. And that's where I actually cut my teeth and, uh, you know, learned about winemaking and learned about, you know, the actual uh, in the chemistry and, you know, working with different varietals and making sparkling wine and making Pinot Noir. And really that's when my, my juices got flowing. And it's like, I could do this for a living. I could do this for a career. So I, I actually went back to Davis and took more classes and then realized that this is, this is, I love it. You know, being in Napa in the eighties was very exciting. It was an exciting time. And, um, and then from there, I, I continued on into uh, working at, I became a winemaker and worked, you know, in the Russian River Valley. I worked in Oregon. So bringing all those opportunities and experiences um, landed me in Santa Barbara County in 2000 as the winemaker at Foley Estates, Bill Foley, who has a fire now. 1998. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's when you moved here. Yeah. But I uh, started working there and during the time where we source grapes, as Kate talked about Santa Barbara County, Santa Barbara County has multiple ABAs or American viticultural areas. And we were sourcing grapes from the Santa Maria Valley. And uh, in 2000, uh, an opportunity came up to pick up four tons of Pinot Noir. And at the time I thought, Why, what a great opportunity to make wine for myself and to kind of set my own kind of signature. And at the time I, uh, I had two pygmy goats and they had a goat house they used to hang out on and they were kind of the uh, originally kind of my pets and lawnmowers and when i ran out of space for them to mow lawns and you know eat weeds 
uh, they basically became domesticated pets. But uh, when I actually made the wine, I didn't really have a name for the winery. Uh, originally, I was going to call it Norman Cellars, but that didn't really ring well. And so I, uh, one evening, while uh, you know, having friends over and talking about wine and talking about the name of a winery, the goats used to jump off the goat house quite often. You know, they'd climb around, climb up, jump yeah. off. You know, that was kind of their, their, uh, their, their MO. And we were drinking a lot of wine, drinking Pinot Noir at the time. And uh, someone said, ha, 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 why don't you call it Flying Goat Cellars? And hence, that's where the name came from, and it stuck. So um, I think it's time to start drinking some Flying Goat Cellars. <laughs> I, yeah. So, um, so for folks who got um, I, um, I I drank it all before I left, uh, just because <laughs> I decided to not check baggage. So I'm drinking, you'll have to excuse me, I'm drinking some Beaujolais um, and coffee. I'm like back and forth. <laughs> Um, but uh, no jet lag yet. Um, so for folks who received wines, what they start, they got the sparkling wine first, right? Correct. So tell us a little about that, and then uh, we can talk a little bit more about uh, Santa Barbara and some of the different places that, that grapes are grown. So what Flying Goat currently produces five sparkling wines, and so five different expressions, and it's called Goat. You want to make life difficult for yourselves. That's true. Well, I actually had made sparkling wine up in Northern California and Oregon, so I felt like I had the experience and the knowledge, but I realized in 2005 that nobody was making sparkling wine in Santa Barbara County, and I had been sampling enough vineyards over the years that I would taste the fruit and say, gosh, this would make a great cuvee, which could make a great sparkling wine, and I always kind of wondered why nobody was doing it. So in 2005, I actually took the plunge and made uh, a couple tons of Pinot Noir into a rosé, and that's what I courted Kate on, was the, uh, the first vintage rosé. I actually disgorged it in her backyard and lost half of it during the disgorging, so I wasn't very, uh, you know, I, was, I still was learning the technique. But fast forward now, you know, 15 years, we, we, we've kind of found a niche, and we've kind of located some of the varietals that we felt make interesting expressions, and, you know, so two of them, the two of them are the rosé and the cremant. The first one we're going to try is the cremant, and that's 100% Pinot Blanc. And so it's kind of falling in the the lines of a kind of an Alsatian style, uh, very fruity, very lively, lots of uh, refreshing fruit flavors, uh, very high acidity. Uh, we kind of call it the, the porch pounder during the summertime. Very, you know, you can sit around outside and, and, and enjoy it while you know a sunny afternoon or. Or maybe for breakfast, you can have it with your, you know, your eggs Benedict. So um, all our sparkling wines are done in the method Champenois, actually done by hand. So that's, uh, you know, a, a labor of love in itself, right there. Uh, I'm going to go actually pour some, and I'll let Kate talk a little bit about them too. Yeah, and so for, for for folks at home, if for some crazy reason you're waiting for us to give you permission to start drinking, please uh, <laughs> don't. Um, just dive in, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go through the wines, but um, don't, don't wait on us for anything. So Kate, tell us, yeah, tell us a little bit more. Um. The Cremant is one of my favorites because it's got some nice tart fruit flavors going on and um, it's just, it's lovely. It's nice, it's fruity, but it's, uh, but it's like a tart fruit and that's why I really enjoy it. And where does the Pinot Blanc come from? Uh, here is the, the, the bottle yep. itself. For people, uh, it's actually there's there's several goats on there that look like bubbles, and it's a cream colored label. So in in the oh there you go, and so this is a 2014 Cremant, which is 100% Pinot Blanc. And did you ask me where the name came from? Where the Pinot Blanc comes from? Oh, the Pinot Blanc. Sorry, it's uh, Sierra Madre. Okay. Um, which is out of the San Rio Valley. And the Sierra Madre has been around for about 40 years, but it was bought by Gallo a few years ago. So. We don't know how much longer we'll be able to source because once Gallo swoops in, they typically like to use all their fruit. So, but we we source we have been sourcing a lot of fruit from Sierra Madre. You never know; people people still get fruit from Monte Rosso. So, um, it's you know, who who can know the ways of Gallo? <laughs> exactly. Just to kind of back up a little bit, so Flying Goat Cellars is an urban winery. So we're actually located in the city of Lompoc. Uh, we've been here over ten years now. And so we source grapes from up and down Santa Barbara, in Santa Barbara County. So we source from the two ADAs, Santa Maria Valley and the Santa Rita Hills. So that's where we get all our grapes from. And we have long-term relationships and contracts with all these vineyards. So uh, we have the benefit of getting some of the best fruit in the county, 
without having the ownership headaches of owning a vineyard and managing a vineyard, which we find uh, very refreshing. But that, but that doesn't mean we don't go in the vineyard. We were in the vineyard last week, checking out what uh, the different vineyard management practices are going on with the different um, owners. And uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to, have, to be able to source from, very, and get, have various different expressions of, uh, for example, Pinot Noirs. Sure. So explain, if you would, just, just quickly, um, like Lompoc, it's, it's familiar to, to, to me, it's familiar to both of you, obviously, um, the Lompoc and the Lompoc Wine Ghetto and, and how things are set up, because I think it's a little bit unique and everyone, everyone thinks about Napa and big buildings and, you know, lots of big parking lots and everything is kind of posh and whatever, and Lompoc's not exactly that way. And that's, when I moved here, that was exactly why I took the job, because there was this industrial park that everybody was calling the, um, the Lump of Wine Ghetto, and I went, what's that? You know, so when I saw it, and really roll-up doors, we're, we're seriously talking about roll-up doors, um, but some of the best wines in the whole state were coming out of it. Sea Smoke was there, um, uh, Phil, oh, um, Burr Clifton was there, and... So when I moved here, there were only about five wineries. Now, at one point, there were about 38. Now we're probably down to, because there's been some attrition, probably down to about 28. But nonetheless, there's a, there's a concentration or clustering. And that's what people were coming around knocking on the roll-up doors to say, hey, I want to taste your wine. And the winemakers weren't ready for that. They were just making their wine in these uh, kind of garage style, you know, fashion but literally like you know, <laughs> yeah. absolutely but these and then but you know the wall street journal was picking up on this ghetto in love hope so anyway i saw this i was like oh my gosh you know this is the diamond in the rough that i would like to help grow and um get you know market and help get some um so we were able to do that and it was it was very satisfying very you know very exciting to be a part of that and then what happened is as wineries grew such as Sea Smoke and Burr Clifton, they moved out of the ghetto, got their own space, and Flying Goat did the same. And that was about the time that I started dating Norm. He was looking for property outside of the ghetto because he was working in a custom crush facility at that time after he left Foley. And um, I, I don't know, did he even mention, did you even mention that he worked for Foley? He moved here to work for Foley. So um, anyway, it was just exciting. And, and now, but the irony about the whole thing is, so Lompoc was founded as a temperance colony back in the 1870s, and it became a wine mecca. And now it's become a cannabis capital as well. So <laughs> we've got to- Always, <laughs> always, always on the cutting edge. Yeah. We yeah. have all the vices. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's funny. I was thinking about it. You were said, you know, Norm, you said you got there in 98 and uh, Kate in 2002. Like, you know, I was sort of, you know, sort of shifting over to writing about wine and food around then. And when I was, when I started, it was sort of this given that Santa Rita Hills and Lompoc were this big thing and they were really on the rise. And it wasn't until probably eight years later that I realized how quickly that had happened that, you know, even in the mid nineties, none of, you know, San, Sanford and Benedict was there, but like none of this was on the map. And, you know, really it was in a span of maybe five years where suddenly this, this, this brand new wine destination kind of showed up and, and you guys were right in the middle of that. Well, you have to say there was a movie called Sideways that didn't hurt. <laughs> Uh, Norm was able to ride on the coattails of Sideways big time. You know, anybody they could see though in, in, um, uh, what was it? Two thousand four was just yeah. you know making banks. So it, it, I mean, I, I mean, I don't. I, I say that with you know tongue in cheek, but it really did elevate the area, and, it, and to this day, it, you know, they still people refer to it, and it 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 did bring a lot of notoriety to uh, Santa Barbara County and Santa Rita Hills, and I think you know, you know, being in the middle, that was exciting times. Making Pinot Noir, selling it was quite easy. Uh, it's changed now a little bit, <laughs> but I think it, it brought, well, a lot of people, when you, you know, you, you talked about Napa and Sonoma, a lot of people in Los Angeles and Southern California didn't know that there was a wine industry up here. They yeah. just assumed all wine came from Napa and Sonoma. And for that movie to actually people recognize it really increased the awareness because, you know, I still, you know, I still travel a lot, you know, selling our wines and you go to the East Coast and people go, well, I didn't know there was a wine region in Santa Barbara County. You know, it's, it's still unknown to a lot of people. 
but at least that movie kind of brought it aware and brought, you know, highlighted Santa Rita Hills and Lompoc. Yeah. And it's interesting because that, that movie, so even, even, even within the world of Sideways, um, and thinking about it then and thinking about it now, uh, you know, going to Taste Wine in Lompoc is still a pretty chill experience versus, say, going to Los Olivos, where it's, it's not Napa, but it's kind of Sonoma. It's like there's, there's 60 tasting rooms there, whereas, you know, if you go to Lompoc, the, the warehouses are still warehouses and things are still pretty uh, sui generis. And you're, and you're more likely to get to meet the winemaker in Long Coke. You know, frequently, Norm will be helping me pour because we're mom and pop. You know, we are the original mom and pop operation. So especially right now under COVID restrictions. So one of the things that's been noticed by some of my wine connoisseur friends is how COVID, by forcing us to go outside and have set up these um, operations outside, which that was never our business model, he said it's taking the wine tasting experience back to the way it was back in the 70s, 60s, 70s in Napa. He said it's lovely because now not only am I, am I getting the tasting with the owners, but also you're sitting down and having a glass with me because it's, it's just more, I'm not at a bar, you know, I'm not, I'm not pouring at a, at a wine tasting bar anymore. So, and people are talking and wanting to share this experience that they're having right now. So we're loving it. It's, it's, I mean, we're, we're loving the fact that people are, are opening up and grateful that we're open right now. So, so um, should we talk about the rosé for a sec? Uh, that was a cremat by Paul. Do you want to? No, not the. Wait. No rosé, but the, um, do you mean okay. the, the next okay. one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, so the next one is the. Uh, this is what I get for being nine hours ahead of you. <laughs> so it's not a rose, but you're thinking rose because it's Pinot Noir, probably. There we go. So <laughs> this is the next wine is the uh, Blanc de Noir. And it's from some friends' vineyard that's um, called Ampelos. And we, we partnered with them because they're biodynamic, um, organic, and sustainable in practice. And it's something that we really appreciate their farming practices and a lot of people are, are gravitating towards that direction. So I think it's our creme de la creme now. I love this particular expression. And um, so we've called it the gold standard because the label actually, Norm shown the label, sure. it's the gold, it truly is the gold standard. So we have the gold goats on there, the <laughs> <Yeah>. golden goats. <laughs> so <they're, yeah. laughs> so I, well, well, the reason we wanted, we wanted to work with a biodynamic vineyard and a good friend of ours has one. And so in 2016, we approached them to buy getting grapes from their vineyard. And particularly, we were interested in clone 115. I worked with that particular clone. It's one of the Dijon clones. And I like the subtlety. I like the expression. And I like the tension on the palate that it gives our sparkling ones. And so we did this in 2016, uh, not with the intent of going no dosage, but hopefully most of our wines are low dosage, no dosage. And we succeeded with it in 2016 with this wine. There is no dosage in this wine. So we're very excited about that. But, you know, the winemaking process is where we age the wines in French oak barrels, like a traditional older style French champagne house. We do, a, I wish we could do four or five years on bottle and tirage, but we can't afford that. But we could do about two years on tirage. So it lets it kind of build out the mouth palate, a little bit of texture on it. And then during our dosage trials, we, we tasted a number of different sweetness levels and we liked it without any dosage so we're very excited to do that and uh, so this is one of the we haven't done a lot of them but this is one of the few we've done recently and, and just excited about the opportunity that we can actually make a, a no dosage or a very brute style sparkling wine from this area uh, so for the newbies like me uh, let's quickly uh, define both dosage and tirage Oh gosh. <laughs> so the tirage, thank you. <laughs> the tirage is actually the addition. So the wine is made during the fall, and usually during the following spring, the wines are removed from barrels or casks, and they go to a tank, and then we add typically sugar, and we add yeast to it, and that starts the refermentation to create the bubbles. And then during that process, the wine is then transferred to a bottle, and a crown cap is put on. And the reason the crown cap is put on is it allows the pressure to build up because each bottle is about 75 to 90 PSI when the fermentation is done. So you don't want anything less on there because it'll, it'll blow up. 
and that's the reason that we have such tiny bubbles is that refermentation in the bottle is very critical because it allows the wine to absorb the CO2 and we get these really fine bead of bubbles in there. So once the wine ages in the, in the, in the bottle after two years, we'll then go through what's called the riddling process of removing, settling, getting the bottle to settle out all the dead yeast in the neck. And then once that happens, we then freeze the neck and remove the crown cap and the plug of yeast comes shooting out because the pressure pushes it out. And that's when we add a dosage if we choose to, but at this time we did not choose to add a dosage to this particular wine. And the cork goes in and the wire hood goes in. So in a nutshell, that's kind of the uh, tourage and disorging. For you wine geeks out there, he'll go yeah. on and on and on. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, it looks better in practice than it sounds. Yeah, I think visually it, it, it's easier to explain it if I had a visual to show you versus you know me doing it my hands like this. But and now that I'm getting so good with video, by the way, folks, I'm sorry for the vertical. I now know to do horizontal for future videos. But now that I'm getting so good with videos, we will be having a um, a video that will show the process coming soon. And John, if you're over here, we'll get you down on disgorging my way. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, okay, so, uh, so Ampl and Amplos is Santa Rita Hills. Yes, We're, it is. Yeah. So let's quickly, if you would, sort of let, like, describe the, the, the difference between Santa Maria Valley and Santa Rita Hills. Because I think folks who are sort of longtime California connoisseurs might know Santa Maria. Uh, they may know it from, uh, you know, say, Oban Climat um, and Jim Clendenin, other folks. Um, and that, that was sort of, you know, the long standing, although technically Santa Rita started in 1971, but um, but then Santa Rita really has been the place where there's been lots of growth, and there are, you know, they're both interesting and they're both important. But explain kind of the two of them and how they're how they're different, what you look for in each one. Well, I, for me, the, the Santa Maria Valley is the older of the two ABAs. It's it's further north of Lompoc and it's a little further inland. It's the second ABA in the state by the way, for those that don't know. Actually, after Napa Valley. Yeah. So it, it was actually, so Santa Maria was actually started developing in the late 60s, early 70s. So uh, Nielsen Vineyard was, I think, developed in 67. Uh, Biennacito Vineyard was planted in 71. So those are two of like the, kind of the pioneers of Santa Maria Valley. And that was back then where they had big tractors and they just put roots and the, they put sticks in the ground and actually planted vineyards that way. It was, uh, it was more farming than viticulture. <laughs> so basically they were kind of uh, experimentation. And so typically Santa Maria is a little bit warmer climate. Uh, it's backed up against the San Ynez Mountains. So you get more of the heat from the San Ynez Mountains. And it's also a little further from the ocean. It's, it's due east of Santa Maria. So it's about 20 miles inland, uh, as opposed to the Santa Rita Hills, which is right by the uh, Point Conception. And for anybody that doesn't know it, uh, Santa Rita Hills is a diurnal valley. It's actually the only diurnal valley along the western United States, meaning it runs uh, west to east. All Napa Valley runs north-south, Russian River runs north-south, Willamette Valley runs north-south. Well, Santa Rita Hills uh, is, is the opposite of that. So it has a very interesting as ge geographical aspect to it. And I think that's what makes it so unique because the Pacific Ocean is only 10 miles from the entrance to the Santa Rita Hills. And that cold mass air always comes drifting in at night. And basically the inland further east of the Santa Rita Hills where you have uh, Happy Canyon and San Ynez Valley, which are much warmer out there, pulls that cold ocean air in. So it really is kind of a tunnel of cold air that comes in here and makes this area so special. And also the soil, there's a lot of limestone soil in the Santa Rita Hills. Um, so John, one thing that um, you may not know is be, we got known, the Santa Rita Hills got known for the um, sparkling, or excuse me, for the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay, but now we we're actually getting known for sparkling wine. And Michael Benedict, one of the co-founders um, you know, of the um, Sanford Benedict Vineyard uh, and label, he, you know, had identified after we were making it and other, he was starting to experience some other expressions. He's, you know, come out and made a statement that he really feels like this is the area in our country that's really going to be closest to Champagne. So, woohoo! <laughs> well, on. Got, uh, who is it? You've got um, you've got the Wenslaus. You've got a handful of folks who've sort of, you know, partnered with actual Champenois to uh, to make 
sparkling wine. So we'll have some really interesting things uh, coming in addition to what's here. Right there. Yeah, so <laughs> here's, I, here, here's a toast to, uh, to Bubbles. And I want to share one more thing is that we've traditionally at our tasting room, we like to pour the bubbles in a flute because it's so beautiful. You really can see the bubbles and you really get to appreciate them. However, we recently started to switch over to the um, bowl, the Pinot bowl, which is what Riedel has been saying all along. And we're finding that the aromatics are much more um, obvious and become much more tantalizing through the bowl because of course it's got a, a wider, wider mouth. So, yeah. for, you know, for those of you that are curious about, I, I love the visual of the bubbles, but I am getting sold on the, the aromatics that come off the bowl. Yeah. Olivier oh, Krug will be very clear in agreement with you. So. Who would? Olivier Krug. Oh. <laughs> I was going to share a little bit about, you know, when we started the Sparkling Wine Project, it was really just a total accident, not accident, but, you know, it was a planned experiment. And it's been interesting to watch the evolution of sparkling wine in Santa Barbara County and the people that take it on and actually and brought it into their portfolio. And what I, I always try to tell people, we're not trying to be champagne. We will never be champagne and I don't really want to be champagne. I want to go to champagne and enjoy champagne. I want people to come here and kind of see the expression of what we're making is a very unique sparkling wine from Santa Barbara County and what kind of showcase what, you know, Santa Barbara makes Santa Barbara County so unique and so special. And I think, that's kind of, we've kind of evolved the Go Bubbles brand into something, you know, very special because we make, you know, five expressions. We make the Cremant, which we just tasted. And we also make a Rosé, which was the initial sparkling wine in 2005. We make a Blanc, we make a Blanc de Blanc, and then we make a Brut Cuvée, and then we make the Blanc de Noir. So we've, we've got a lot of, we've, we've kind of indulged in a lot of different expressions, but we find that they're all unique and really quite special. And I think it allows us to say, this is also something that's, you know, very different and uh, special to this area. For sure. And so what, uh, which still wines did folks get? They got two Pinot Noirs? Yes, they did. They got the uh, two, the two, uh, we got two different Pinots, one from the Santa Maria Valley, which is the Deerberg Vineyard. And then they got, so that's the, the warmer ABA. And then we also got one, uh, the 2014 uh, Rio Vista Vineyard, uh, Dijon clone, which was from the Santa Rita Hills. So I thought it would be fun for people to kind of taste the same winemaking hand, but from two different regionalities in Santa, uh, in Santa Barbara County. For sure. So which should, which should folks start with? Deerberg or? Uh, I'd say start with Deerberg. That would be the. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, Deerberg and that vineyard. And, and again, sort of back to Santa Maria, because Again, you know, it's to your point, it's, it really has a long history and it is an extraordinary, versatile place to grow grapes. Um, you know, not, not just Pinot, there's, I mean, Coupe, that's where all the Coupe Syrahs originally came from. Pinot Blanc, to your point, there's Rancho Sisquoc with everything in the world. Um, but uh, what, what tell, tell us a little about the Deerberg Vineyard and how you came to work with it and, and what you look for. Well, I came to work with it when I was working at Foley Estates in 1998. So having come from Oregon, uh, the first time I went to Oregon for nine, eight years, and uh, I, hadn't seen 20, I hadn't seen any grapes over 24 bricks in eight years. So <laughs> my first vintage at Foley Estates, I actually saw some very ripe fruit. And one of the first vineyards I, I actually got to work with was the Deerbrook Vineyard. And I just, I just fell in love with the, the generosity of fruit and the, you know, the unique expression, you know, a lot of years that, you know, when it's a riper or warmer vintage, you get this really, uh, they call it Santa Maria sunshine. And you kind of get that in, you know, the expressions of the fruit, you know, some years it's plum, some years it's black cherry, some years it's cola and it has this unique, it's a special site. It's, you know, it's located on uh, kind of in the middle between uh, Bienocito Vineyard to the east and uh, Solomon Hills to the west, so those are, it's kind of in the middle. So it's a, it's a very hot site. It does get warm there. It's, uh, it's kind of a very deep clay soil with a lot of loam, so it, it holds its acid quite well. It does get warm, but it, you know it's one of those. It's just real special. Uh, Mr. Deerberg, who at the time and still is the sole owner of uh, First Bank, uh, so he he's able to bankroll the vineyards quite well. And when I approached, <laughs> that's how to do it. That's how to buy a vineyard. 
<laughs> so when I approached him in 2001 with a label called Flying Goat, I said, I want to buy, you know, four tons of Pinot. And he's like, Flying Goat, wow, you know what? And I said, man, what? I love your fruit. He, he said, didn't take him seriously. He didn't take me seriously, but that was before Mr. Deerberg even had a label. He just sold grapes. So, uh, you know, fast forward, I still continue to source fruit from him up until uh, last year. But uh, sad, sad news that the, they just actually uh, pulled all the vines out from in, uh, starting this year uh, from the Deerberg Vineyard. And I, uh, it was, it broke our heart. We went to the vineyard last week and we knew it, it happened, but to see it, to just see a whole vineyard just ripped is, is painful. But that's what's going on in Santa Maria these days, given the economic climate and any vineyards that don't seem to be producing as, as well as the owner would like, they seem to be ripping, ripping them out. And there's um, also been some disease and like red blotch and whatnot. So economic uh, factors that come into play. But, you know, fortunately we're resilient. We can pick up another vineyard from um, some other Santa Maria Valley because Norm's got great name recognition. But it was a great run from 2001 to 2019 with um, sure. Mm -hmm. We love it. It's very, it's much more earthy. It's much more for me, for my palate. And, you know, remember everybody's palate's different, but I, I love the earthiness of this. What do you, what do you? I love, I love the, I've always just loved that fruit expression. You know, I, I love, I love cherries. I love uh, fresh fruit. I love summer fruits. So to me that those, those are truly the, the things that always come through to me. And it always has, because uh, we source also from the Solomon Hills vineyard, which is due west, and we source from Diamacito. So we have, a, you know, we have this spice rack of different fruit. Yeah. And so Deerberg always is much different because the Solomon Hills, which we're not pouring today, but we source from, is due west of us. And so it's a little cooler climate. It's much sandier soil. And that's always more on the sour cherry, a little bit more Burgundian spectrum. And then Diamacito being further east, which is old vines for us, it's on its own rootstock that's much more earthy and savory and so you know it just has it's so fun god i just love making pinot <laughs> <laughs> just because i'm sure we'll talk about it when we get to um the rio vista uh, what what are the clones what are the the selections that uh you were using for deerberg uh to, i have used a multiple selections this particular one is clone 115 which Thank is um, pardon me like the like the sparkling wine like yeah and, and this is one i've used over a number of years off the property um you know i've actually i bounced around a couple different blocks over the years but i always found this one was kind of the one that really kind of hit the the, the, the high tones of what i call santa maria valley kind of um i hate to be uh a t I, I taught for five six years at junior college i call my textbook pinot noir and you know, this is kind of, it's got the beautiful theater expression. It's got the nice balance. It's got the nice finish. It's got, it's got all the things that, you know, I, I enjoy, a, a, you know, a very elegant and well-made Pinot Noir. And so that's what I've always uh, found exciting and interesting about it. Um, one thing I want to mention about Deerberg. So we started sourcing in 2001 and that 2001 is still tasting amazing. We open them up every, you know, every once in a while and, as soon as we do, I, I share them in the tasting room. People are buying them like crazy. Get in library wine in, in our area like that, you know. Most people can't lay down wines that long. And so we don't have a lot, but we like to share. So anyway, our, we have a lot of ageability with our Pinot Noirs. This is the Ron, beauty. Could you share any comments on the wines when you did taste them a week ago or any? any? <laughs> I mean, they were, they were lovely. Um, I, I, you know. I would have total brain fail. Um, <laughs> um, and I also, you know, I, I tend to like to let folks discover their own thing. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, but that's why it's interesting because there's, you know, you clearly get, um, you know, it's, it's the two different expressions of Santa Barbara. And to your point, you get Santa Maria um, showing itself much more overtly. Um, and, uh, you know, being being a little bit more um, exuberant. Um, that's not exactly the word I'm looking for. Um, but then Santa Rita, which which we which we will get to next or now, I guess. Um, you know, is its own really compelling, interesting place because whereas there, you know, Santa Maria is all about the sunshine. The the climate in Santa Rita is so utterly unique. 
Um, it is, I think, actually not that many people know this, it has one of the most narrow diurnal swings in the country, um, which is to say it never gets hot and it never gets old. It's, it, it, it's like, I think, year across the year it's a max swing of 20 degrees maybe 25 degrees law pope. <laughs> yeah. you know what and that's what and that's why our real estate now is going crazy i know in different parts of the country right now it's the real estate is going down our real estate is off the charts because a lot of people from san diego orange county and los angeles are wanting to just relocate here they've been coming up here drinking wine you know and now they're just like get me out of the city Right. So, Central Coast is kind of the you know the best kept secret in in California, and um, our specific area. They say when you drive from Lompoc to Buellton, which is twenty miles up the road, every mile is a degree warmer. Exactly. So if you really like hot, you get over to Los Olivos or San Ynez. But if you really like cool, like a hot day in Lompoc is seventy five degrees. That's like really we're all like fanning ourselves. So that's yeah, one yeah. thing. That I think uh, and if you want really cool climate Pinot Noir, you put it over on the western side near Lompoc. And if you want Grenache, you put it over close to Buellton. Well, and, and, and actually, that's if you if people you know when you drive from uh, Lompoc to Buellton, and when you go east of Buellton towards Solvang and San Inez, you see you know you start seeing Syrah, Grenache as you go through you know the the, the San Inez Los Olivos region, and when you go further east towards Happy Canyon. That's when you see the Bordeaux, you see more Sauvignon Blanc, you, more, you see more Cabernet and Merlot. So obviously you're not going to see any Pinot Noir grown out in Cappy Canyon, and you're yeah. not going to see any Cabernet grown out in Santa Rita Hills. Yeah. God yeah. forbid. <laughs> We're known for being, for having more varietals, I think. Grow, I think Santa Barbara County grows more diversity of varietals than any other county in the country. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, we'll Tell us about Rio Vista. Okay. <laughs> um, and Dijon clones, which ultimately, I guess we're all, we're talking about all Dijon clones and Dijon clones, my very, very quick shorthand for folks is these are selections of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay that were, um, that were isolated um, starting in the 60s, but ultimately collected by the 1980s, um, shipped over to Oregon State University, and they became sort of the new generation of genetic material that American Pinot Noir producers uh, and, and Burgundian Pinot Noir producers used to make their wines. Well, he's a UC Davis guy, so he'd probably say they were shipped over to UC Davis. It depends what your alma mater is. <laughs> but I think, you know, what, what is, is fascinating is to know that the Dijon clones, actually, I worked in Oregon when the Dijon clones were being introduced, and they were really uh, quite helpful in getting Oregon where they are right now. Because at the time, Oregon made some great Pinots in the 80s and 90s, but without this, these clones that actually reach maturity, have great flavors, have great tannins, and, and reach a, a developed flavor that you know, makes it an elegant wine, they, they were challenged. Uh, I'm sure you know a fellow named David Lett of Irie Winery. He was kind of the mm -hmm. papa of Pinot Noir. And he was making, you know, wine up in the Dundee Hills, and you know, he was he was on the cutting edge. And you know, when these clones came in, I think they were able to kind of change the landscape. And then they were actually brought down here into California, and they changed the landscape. Because um, actually, the original some of the original clones I worked with back in the '80s was the California Martini clone, which is not meaning the Martini to drink, but Louis Martini. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But. <laughs> But Louis Martini, the winemaker, actually discovered that clone of Carnero, so that was quite commonly planted. But it's a much different morphology. You know, the Dijon clones are thin skin, they're smaller clusters. They tend to see to ripen a little bit uh, sooner because they're not used to the California sunshine, but they do make some very elegant mm -hmm. wines. Uh, this particular wine has three of the Dijon clones. Um, I don't know if they know, if people, our people know, but they're, they're, they're all numbered. Uh, they start, you know, I've heard of 113, 114. This particular one has a blend of 115, 667, and 777. Those three are the kind of predominant clones that you find in the Santa Rita Hills and Santa Maria Valley. Um, and everywhere. Yeah, and anywhere, you know. Uh, we actually work with another clone that's not in a Dijon clone. It's called Bottomsville or 2A, which is a Swiss clone, which we really enjoy. And it's a much different expression than the Dijon clones, but it's interesting, 
in the same vineyard, in the Rio Vista vineyard, which you're drinking right now, we have three of the Dijon clones and we have the, the 2A. And the 2A being a Swiss clone, ripens much later and it's much later to develop compared to the Dijon, the Dijon clones, which is quite fascinating. Um, and it makes a totally different wine. For sure. But, uh, these three clones are much more, I, I call them, you know, every year the blend changes. So we harvest the, the three different clones at different times. And so we, we barrel age them. And then about a year after barrel aging, we then make the blend up. And so it's interesting every year, the percentage of 667 and 777 and 115 are quite different. Kate participates in this blending. So is our cellar master. And it's always like, where do we want to go with this one? Oh, I like a little bit more 115. Oh, I want 777. And it's always kind of where- I have the notes. As we know, <laughs> women have a greater sense. <laughs> of smell and so if it doesn't smell have a fabulous aromatics then it doesn't go out the door so I, I think, hey, do you have a do you have a preference between them uh, is there one that always you, you find yourself gravitating to well rancho santa rosa which isn't in, in our right now that's owned by foley estate in santa rita hills that nose usually blows my mind because it's so fruit driven i think it's just what the clones oh the clones mm -hmm. No, Here's I two, but I was thinking. I was thinking in, in terms of the blending. Yeah, is they're like, you I know, the six six seven that greens through. The six six seven, I call it like the, I just, the, the foundation of our house. Kind of, we lay that. We lay that. We always lay the six six seven. Like everybody's okay. We love it. Yeah. How much do we want to use it? And then we look at the seven 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 and the one fifteen as kind of the, the walls and the rafters. How much we want to build around it to kind of allow the wine to kind of age and give us some structure. And I think those are. And those, those always change every year for us. Um, and it just depends on the, the vintage. i just share with you, the 2014 was actually a little bit of a warmer vintage with us. Uh, we actually, uh, we were still in the drought years. And so uh, we actually harvested a little bit sooner, probably about two weeks earlier than we normally do. Typically we're late September with Santa Rita Hills and uh, the Deerberg usually early, you know, early September. We were definitely uh, earlier than normal and it's just you know how we roll with this new climate of ours yeah so situate us a little bit with rio vista because it's again as we said even within santa rita like you could be colder you could be warmer you could be north valley you could be south valley um where is the vineyard itself so it's the most eastern vineyard in the santa rita hills so i call it called the, the microclimate within the the, the, uh, the ava because even though there's uh, the river that runs through the Santa Rita Hills, it's the San Inez River, and it kind of divides uh, north, north of the northern part of Santa Rita Hills and the southern part of the Santa Rita Hills. It's kind of at the it's the most eastern vineyard. So it's actually, I call it more of the Bilton heat effect than the cooling effect from the ocean. Yes, it does get the cooling. You can stand in the vineyard, but it takes 15 miles for that wind to kind of wind through and get a, a, a cooling effect in the vineyard versus being so close to Builton, and actually the Builton being a little warmer climate actually builds a little bit more heat up. So typically it's, it, it ripens a little bit sooner and there's a little bit more spice character to it. For sure. So Candice, do we have uh, some questions at all? Has, has anyone got, got things to... Yes, we, we do. And I have uh, our, uh, our admin uh, actually manage that. Yeah. Uh, but, but I have a quick question. Um, and this is uh, not necessarily wine related, but we also advertise this as 20, uh, 230th anniversary of uh, the foundation of Washington, D.C., uh, based on uh, the Residence Act, which, is, uh, which was the act for establishing uh, the temporary and permanent uh, seat of the government, uh, which was Washington, D.C. Uh, um, uh, Kate, you have a history in Washington, D.C. Uh, <laughs> you, you have the key to the town, right? Do it. I can't even tell you it all, but I can tell you, starting in 1800, my great great you all remember that great, great, great <laughs> grandfather was sent to Washington to establish the new capital as the first assistant postmaster general, and he retained that position for 30 years. So as he was this element of continuity during all these different changes of administration, and his home was what is now the Chevy Chase Club. And um, it actually is called the Bradley House. His name was Abram Bradley, and it's called the, the, um, the old house that the club is called the Bradley House. And so that was one of my answers. And then each one of his 
um, you know, descendants after that was a famous lawyer or a judge or something or something. And they're all buried over in um, Oak Hill Cemetery. And just when I was there earlier this year, I went and visited my ancestors and gave homage to them. But one, um, one of them was a, um, a, sea, a sea captain or sea whatever. You know, he, was, he was a commissioner in the early years of, um, and he also became a minister in Peru where I've lived. So it was fun to, for me, of course, when I moved to, I, when I lived in Washington for four years and I didn't know all this family history because in California, people don't care so much. But when I moved back East and I had met all my relatives or some of my relatives there, I started to take this big interest in my ancestry. And I was like, well, this is pretty cool. So I do have a long line of um, Bradleys and um, other names in that city and it's fun. Quite fun. Amazing. So, congratulations to DC for surviving because there's a wonderful book called Empire of Mud that you all should read because it really gives you the straight skinny about all of the nastiness going on in Washington's early founding years. It wasn't it wasn't wonderful. And that's why my ancestors didn't live, you know, they ultimately moved outside of what was the the, the downtown area because it really was an empire of mud. Any specific questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I was just raising a glass for L'Enfant who tried to make it. <laughs> <laughs> and he failed, you know? He yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta read the book because you're gonna be amazed what they have to say about him. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Washington sent him packing. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> Washington's a wonderful city now and I love to go back. Okay, so uh, we have some attendees, and if you guys have any questions, um, there are some buttons at the bottom of your screen that you can either type into a question in the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand. There's a little button that says raise hand, and then I can allow you to speak your question um, to our lovely host today. And if we don't get raised questions, there were a couple that were submitted, so I'll go ahead and start with that. Um, I know that we have some weather changes now with global warming and, and COVID is also affecting a lot of consumer preferences. Um, so they were wondering how are you dealing with these environmental and, and sort of like health changes that are really impacting everyone? Should we go ahead and, and answer directly? Yep. Okay. Well, first of all, we've opened up an outdoor seating area, which was mandatory. Um, it was mandated by the governor a couple of weeks ago, which was a complete surprise because that means people are in our parking lot. But if you go to my website, you'll see that we've made it as attractive as one could make a, a parking lot and people are loving it. You know, it's, it's fun to see how people are embracing it. We've got our purples, our theme and, and it's, it's been playful and fun, but, um, um, also, just in terms, of course, we're very, you know, there's all these rules in California about using masks, and um, I actually use a shield, and, you know, so we're very, we're very conscientious about following all the health prescriptions for, for COVID. I think it also is enables us to kind of be light on our feet and be able to kind of change as the environment changes, and, you know, as our governor here makes mandates, we have to like, okay, what do we do now, and it's kind of fun to watch our neighbors, you know, how do they, how do they set up their parking lot? How do they make these changes? And we all, we all work together, which has been fun. And I think it's, uh, it is interesting to, uh, you know, be a part of it. Uh, speaking to climate change, um, yes, we, I have noticed earlier, uh, harvesting times. I've ever noticed also that we, but we're also challenged here in California because we have, we do have drought conditions. California has always been a drought state. It's never been an abundance of rain, and particularly here on the Central Coast. So we, we've adjusted. Uh, the people in the vineyards also are very, you know, recognize that, they, you know, they, they a certain amount of crop, crop, cover crop in, you know, the early spring to get the nutrients in the ground. And then they're also kind of recognize the canopy of management and the, number, the amount of fruit left on the line to kind of allow the vines to mature in a, a natural way that doesn't affect the flavors at all. So. We feel very fortunate that we are in a situation where everybody's adapting and changing and still the wise turn out brilliant. Great. Yeah, I know that um, I work in geopolitical risk and a lot of talk right now is happening around supply chains and 
resiliency and flexibility. So I know that happens even in the US, not just abroad. Um, so we had another question about, since you guys don't grow your own grapes, um, which makes your vintages more varied than normal. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about your vintages. How, we don't know how that makes our vintages more varied. Mm -hmm. uh, Norm decides when to harvest. That's something that's very important for a winemaker's style. And so we go in the vineyards and, and watch the development of the fruit and, and check the bricks and the pH levels. So um, I don't really do. I, yeah, can you clarify that question? Because I mean, are you, are you asking about the variance in vintages or the variables? Um, I think the type of grapes that go into them is the question. Well, I mean, every vintage is unique and special. And so we, we treat it. Every vineyard is a special vineyard uh, and nothing that we don't do anything particularly different. I think we, you know, we try to achieve the best balance we can between, you know, uh, the sugar level, the potential alcohol and, you know, flavor development. I think for us, it's all about flavor. You know, since we don't own the vineyards, we want the flavors to come through. So for example, you know, the Santa Maria vineyard, those flavors are very unique compared to the Santa Rita Hills. And so it's, you know, it's all about, achieving a balance while making the wines and, and having that uh, unique qualities come through. But I think we need to explain that we're committed to certain blocks. So every year we have blocks or rows that we're committed to. So we're getting, you know, we're getting specific uh, Pinot Noir from this block. And, you know, so that doesn't, that's not going to, um, like, that's a fix. Uh, I guess, I guess the, um, the, you know, the, the, the related question to that, is how often do you find that you want to or need to switch sources? So I think everyone thinks, oh, you know, I'm gonna start kind of a virtual winery and I can buy my grapes and, you know, do all this. But the thing is, you know, e even if you're doing that, you don't necessarily wanna start over at point A and figure out a whole new vineyard. So we had to because of Deerberg. And two years ago we had to because via Nacido, we were sourcing from heritage vines they were over 40 years old and they got red blood, so they had to rip. So we sourced immediately from Nielsen because we always have a lot of options because of our, um, our reputation for fine winemaking. So that's, that's, it's kind of fun. You know, I mean, it's sad, sad to see a vineyard go, but at the same time, you know, there's a new opportunity. So if, if, unless uh, uh, our attendees have any other questions, we've got about uh, two minutes left or so. Um, and I don't, I don't see anyone raising their hand, but, um, it's okay. Um, oh, yes. so um, oh yeah. yeah. No, no, I just wanted to mention that, uh, uh, can, uh, can we benefit from uh, your generous discount for a longer period of time if people have not made their purchase yet? Sure. I'm try to figure out how to do it through the end of the month. How's that? Yeah. Um, and we did get one more question. Um, which is, this is from Emily, uh, curious how you anticipate the social distancing is going to affect wine education uh, and let's say tasting experiences because it's such a, you know, it's a tactile thing that you're sort of, you're doing in close quarters. Uh, how do you do it when suddenly you're, you're all supposed to be sitting back a little bit? Well, there's been a lot of virtual tastings, you know, obviously this is one of many that are going on out there and it's not my favorite, but hey, in lieu of not having any interaction, we'll take it. And um, we need to perfect our style. That's one of the things we're, you know, we're working on, but um, a lot of people are finding success in that. So, but if anybody can come around to our tasting room, we will practice social distancing as long as COVID's a problem. And, um, you know, we'd love to see you and let me know. So I'm usually there. Let me know. <laughs> Part of the Columbia alumni group. And and quickly, if if folks uh, are are in D.C. or or anywhere else, they want to come visit. Uh, they want to come visit Santa Barbara. They want to come visit Lompoc. What's sort of the what's the like sixty second how to do it uh, on on getting there on just planning a trip? Oh gosh, email me Kate at Sellers <laughs> com. I can help you. There's also Visit Santa Barbara, but they're pretty much skewed for Santa Barbara, not North County. We're considered, North County is considered the wine country and you know how politics goes. So, but I'd say, um, uh, you know, come, if you want to come specifically with wine on your mind, then. Well, the, our taste room's open Thursday through Monday, 11 to four. Yeah. So you're, you're more welcome to drop in anytime. 
you can send us any, you can visit our website at flyingboatsellers.com um, or you can call us. Uh, we're, we're always, we're around. We're and I love to be personal concierge. So there you have it. What better, what better service than that? And if, and if folks are coming, it's about two and a half hours from LA. Um, yeah. yeah, if you get a good traffic situation, it could be two and a half hours from LAX specifically. But we do have an airport in Santa Barbara that's wonderful. It's small, it's easy breezy, you know, easy peasy. So I recommend flying directly into Santa Barbara because it makes your life a lot easier. Perfect. Um, well, thank you both so much. Um, thank you for hosting. Thank you. Well, and, uh, thank you so much. And I just want to mention that we, we're going to add uh, the incredible uh, cooking instruction, uh, the award-winning uh, piece. Thanks, Kate. And thanks, Noor. And uh, thanks, uh, John. Uh, good night. You know, you're, you're going to have, uh, finally, we will let you go to, go, go to sleep with all the coffee. Drink you drink the rest of the bottle and go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to post the, the video uh, in, in a day or so uh, on our YouTube channel. Well, everybody will receive a link. Uh, so um, if there's no other question, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Salud. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers up. <laughs> the recipes I'm using today are from Julia Child's Kitchen. Um, I happen to think this is kind of the Bible for me as far as cooking. I use it kind of as a, a backbone for all my recipes. Um, and so I've chosen her, uh, it's called the Electric Blender Food Processing Pie Crust Dough. There's a French name for it, but I would probably not do well with the pronunciation of it. So the first portion of it is I'm going to actually make the dough this morning. Um, I've modified the recipe a little bit just because some of the things in here I have chosen from health reasons and just kind of a personal uh, health viewpoint uh, how we live. I'm not going to use as much salt in the recipe and I'm not going to use any lard or shortening. So that's kind of where we're going to, a little bit of modification, not too much. Um, so the first thing what I've used is the, the flour I'm using is uh, from Bob's Red Mill. It's an artisan bread flour. Typically I use a whole wheat flour, but I've been able to do that recently just because there's been a shortage of flour. So the, and then what I've got, I've got my in the recipe requires um, one and a quarter sticks of butter, chilled butter, chopped up. Um, and then it says about a half a cup to a third a cup of chilled water and some salt. And then obviously we have our food processor. This is a Cuisinart food blender that I'm using. So anyway, as they can kind of see that they're getting chopped up nicely. My dough is in the refrigerator. It's, it's sitting in there. It's getting nice and cold. A little chance for the, the, the dough to kind of settle down before we roll it out. So usually I leave it in there. I can leave it in overnight or I can, I'm going to leave it in for a couple hours and it will pull that out and roll that. So the two quiches we're going to make today are quiche au fromage and quiche Lorraine, which are my two favorite. Uh, quiche au fromage, we're going to actually do a little variation. We're going to do some sauteed red onions and the quiche Lorraine, which is the classic one with bacon. Uh, so, I've just chopped up, I'm using a, an organic red onion, uh, once again, we have these personal preferences, we'd like to choose organic, this is a, fortunately it's a lot local, but it is an organic onion, I kind of pulled out about three medium sized onions, um, and then I'm going to saute it with a little olive oil, and some salt, and some flying goat pinot grease, a, our favorite skillet here is a cast iron skillet, Kate's dad gave it to us, he's an old cowboy, and he's, he cooked over a lot of open fires out in Arizona in the middle of the desert, round up cattle, and we love this. It's well seasoned. It, I love it for omelets. I love it for sauteing. We've had it about eight, nine years. It's got all kinds of flavors in there. So anyway, we're going to get it up on a little low heat to kind of get the uh, saute, to do a slow saute of these onions. Um, I'm going to pour just a little bit of olive oil in there, about a tablespoon to one tablespoon to two. And then we're going to put the onions in there. There we go. You don't want to cook them too high. You know, I, I like to do it real slow. The idea is to get the kind of, um, let the flavors come out. These are onions were a little strong. I noticed when I was cutting up, I wasn't quite tearing up, but uh, so I think it's going to take a little while to saute these. Oh, they look beautiful. 
So they're nice small chunks, just kind of move them around a little bit. Um, I'm gonna, they say about a teaspoon of salt, but I'm gonna use a little bit of a, I'm gonna use a pinch of salt here, a little rock salt here. Add that there to kind of sweeten up the onions since they were a little bit hot. And then just gonna, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to saute the onions and then I'll leave them in the pan and let them caramelize because I want the kind of the sweetness to come out and that'll, that'll just, you know, add to the flavor of the quiche. Okay, hey, these onions are looking fantastic. Look at that, look at that. It's a nice kind of caramelized color to it, kind of a little brown and gray and black to it. They've been sauteing for about 20 minutes. Um, I'm gonna actually give it a little taste. Mmm, they've kind of sweetened up a little bit. It takes about 20 minutes or so. Kind of the sweetness to them. They're, they know that hotness is from the onion itself. So what I'm going to do is add a little bit of our flying goat Pinot Gris to it to kind of finish up the process. Um, and I'll add a little splash. Probably I'd say a half a cup. And as Julie would say, a little bit for the dish and a little bit for me, but still it's early this morning, so we won't do that quite yet. So as that sits, uh, I'm going to let that kind of sit saute for about a minute or two. Get all those juices mixed in there, especially with that Pinot Gris. This is an Alsatian style Pinot Gris. Uh, it's from a vineyard up in Santa Maria, which is in northern Santa Barbara County. And uh, we, we love the, the flavors that come out of it. Typically got all pears and apples. So it's a nice little cooking wine. It's a nice little addition to the, the onions. So the onions have sauteed. They've got the, the Pinot Gris in there. So what I'm gonna do is then move them into a bowl here and just let them sit, let them cool down, get all that good juice in there, all those good flavors. The second quiche is quiche Lorraine, which is with bacon. Uh, I have uh, purchased some bacon uh, from a local grocery store. It's uh, no preservatives, no nitrates. It's an apple smoked wood bacon. It's a, not quite a pound, I think it was 12 ounces. I kind of chopped that up really finely. I'm going to then saute that. In. So this is the next move. So like I said, this is about 12 ounces of bacon. We'll go for a medium heat and let that saute for about oh, five, five, 10 minutes. You want it kind of, kind of crispy, but you don't want to overcook it because it's going to get baked in with the cage floor in. We've just finished sauteing the, uh, sauteing the bacon. It looks gorgeous. It's nice and brown, not too overcooked. Uh, I pulled the, the pastry dough out of the refrigerator. It's been sitting in there for a minimum of two hours. And I let it sit on the counter and thaw out a little bit. So what you want to do while you're letting the, the pastry thaw out, and we're going to roll it out next, I'm going to preheat the oven to 450. Heated pie crust. This is uh, the first, I did the first one already. I had pulled out the dough out of the refrigerator. As you can see, there's a, a ball right here, and I've let it warm up. Uh, I'm using two nine-inch Pyrex uh, pie pans, which work really well. Um, and so the dough's been sitting here. I'm gonna actually kind of flatten it out a little bit. It's uh, kind of gotta prepare it. Um, I'm actually using a nice piece of uh, wax paper to roll it out on. I've got my rolling pin here uh, to roll it with, and then if you don't have a rolling pin, a Bordeaux bottle works quite well. So a Cabernet bottle or a Merlot bottle would work well as a rolling pin for a backup. So I have to kind of massage the dough a little bit uh, to kind of loosen it up. You get, get it warmed a little bit with your hands. It helps a little bit because you don't want to, you don't want to overwork it too much. Um, it, then it becomes, it'll start breaking apart. But I already rolled the first one out and it came out really nice. I was really pleased with it. Like I said, not using this flour before. So I, I'm just kind of pushing it down and slowly kind of getting it in a nice circle. And then I just take the rolling pin and I'm just gonna kind of gently massage it out. It's gonna, you know, this is gonna take a little while, but uh, slowly kind of work on it a little bit and just kind of, Go east, west, and then go north, south. So this is this, you know, kind of slowly push it out. You don't want to go too hard. I found if you go too hard, then the dough starts sticking to the rolling pin. You just want to go real gentle, like. 
find it's kind of therapeutic to kind of touch the stove and watch it kind of evolve and as it kind of flows and moves. Okay, so we rolled it out. Look at that, it came out really nice. I'm really pleased with that. Um, I've taken my pie pan. Looks like it's perfect. I'm just gonna drop the pie pan over. I'm gonna just slide it and just flip it. Love, love the great thing about wax paper. And just slowly kind of peel the wax paper away. And that's Cooper, our chocolate lab. He's hovering underneath me. He goes, oh, Dad, you're so good about dropping things on the floor. So he's, vac he's the vacuum cleaner here in the kitchen. Thank you, Cooper. What I'm going to do now is, you see it's kind of laid in there. What happens, there's a little air pocket so you can caught around the inside. So I'm just kind of, kind of lift, up, lift it up a little bit and just kind of push it down with my fingers. Kind of lift it up, get those air pockets out. And just kind of, and now the dough's nice and warm, so it's easy to work with with your fingers. And so just go real gentle, kind of go around there, get that air pocket, kind of form it into the pan. And then once you've done that, kind of, I kind of push it up to the edge, so it's got a nice edge there. And now we'll them. move them into the oven and cook for seven to eight minutes at 450. We pulled the. Uh, cr the pie crust out of the oven, we let it cool. I went ahead and made the quiche Lorraine already. I followed the recipe on uh, Julie Child's all-purpose quiche filling proportions. Seasoning. So now I'm gonna actually do it for the quiche de fromage. So I'm gonna, I'm actually do, demonstrate that recipe right here for you. Uh, uh, here in Lompoc, we actually uh, source farm fresh eggs. And so the recipe calls for, I say about six eggs, but as you can see, Six, these eggs aren't the same. And that's the, that's the beauty and love about farm fresh eggs is they're never the same or the same color. So I'm gonna put six in, I may need seven. I just can't tell. It's kind of an eyeball thing, but I always recommend six. Or actually three quarters of a cup of Jarlsberg cheese, uh, already pre-grated. Um, you could use Gruyere, you could use uh, a cheddar cheese. I just sometimes like to empty things out of the refrigerator. Jarlsberg seemed to be hanging around. I thought it'd be a good match with the uh, sauteed onions, the caramelized onions. So here we go. First of all, I will actually uh, put the onions in. Oh, those look delicious. Oh, we'll save a little bit for a just a sample, make sure that they're, they're safe. And we'll sprinkle the cheese in, a little Jarlsberg on top. Look at that, it's gonna be gorgeous. This is gonna be fun. And then I'll go ahead and crack open, I'll do six eggs. We'll see what that looks like. So you can see different sizes. Side. Go ahead and mix that up. Uh, what I also like to do is I like to let the eggs sit out for a little while, get the room temperature. I don't like to use uh, really cold eggs. Same thing with milk. I like to bring that out, keep it, get it room temperature. So I go ahead and mix this up. Uh, I've got about, about a half a cup of milk. Uh, the rest, Julia's recipe recommends cream. I like to use milk, uh, but you can use cream. It is very good with cream. We just didn't happen to have any in the house. Once again, a modification, but that's part of, that's part of cooking. Uh, the recipe also recommends uh, some seasoning. I'm gonna go with a little salt and pepper, salt and pepper, a couple twists of salt. Uh, they say a pinch of pepper. I'm gonna do more than a pinch. I like a little pepper. I like to see really you know, black spots in there. And then they say a pinch of nutmeg. I don't use uh, powdered nutmeg. I actually, we have whole nutmeg seeds. So I've got about a half a seed here or a pod. And I'm gonna go ahead and grate that in. I love the smell of nutmeg. Uh, one of those wonderful aromas. I love smelling nutmeg and wine. It's kind of a brown spice that you sometimes get in Pinot Noir wine. And that's from the barrel aging, uh, especially newer barrels. That looks good in there. And mix it up. And voila. And we're gonna pour it in. Yeah. 
And I try not to take it up too high because it could spill over, but looks like it's going to work out just perfectly. So that was seven eggs instead of six. So I'm glad I went with a little extra. Um, I preheated the oven at 375. We will now put these in the oven for 35 minutes and pull them out. Okay, hey, look at this. I just opened up the oven door after 38 minutes and they look gorgeous. I stuck a knife in both of them. The knife came out clean. And here we go. This is the quiche Lorraine. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? I'm going to put it over here. Quiche Lorraine. Got a little poofy. And the quiche de fromage.